So today uh, we're going to be showing the students um, how to use 2017 Mastercam or Mastercam 2017 to rough in the step block that um, for the NIMS uh, certification. We're just using this part as a demonstrator to show how you can use one end mill or two end mills to rough an entire part in and leave ten thousandths on the walls for a nice leisurely uh, finish cut. So just to give you, start with a part overview, if you look over here, this is NIMS Job Duty 2.5 and 2.6. We call it the step block. It's two and a half inches long, inch and seven eighths wide, and uh, inch and three eighths high. So um, the, the, what all we're going to be doing today is showing you the features for, uh, that have to be stepped in here, all right? So the golden rule of most machining is to grab the part one time and machine all that you possibly can in that setup. The next part of the golden rule of machining is to rough everything if possible and then finish everything. Because if you have any problems in any one area, you may still have stock enough left to save the part. All right, so uh, we are gonna rough in all, uh, all of these steps. We're gonna rough in this slot and here is the, uh, the SolidWorks model showing the um, block as, a, uh, as just as a dumb solid. So these are the steps. This is the block and that is the slot. And that's what we have over here. Block, steps, and slot. We named our features. All right. So if you would, uh, here's how we're going to accomplish this. You, you don't do dynamic machining unless you have the right tools or as right as possible. Some of these tools are expensive, so for instance, like hydraulic chucks. But you must have an end mill designed to do this type of cutting, which is characterized by great depth of cut, but a small step over and, and fast RPMs and fast feed rate, uh, called by chip load. So if you come over here, this is a VI Pro uh, from a company called Kodiak Tools that we've purchased. It is five flutes. It has an inch and a half of flute length. It is all tin or aluminum, aluminum titanium nitride coated. And it has a variable flute angle. As these five flutes go around, they engage the part at a, um, at, at a different time and in a different way. All right. So we looked up speeds and feeds for these and this information. And we came up with a, a we're, we're going to be cutting 4140 steel and we're going to cut it at about 450 surface feet a minute and we're going to use down here on the bottom a 3000 chip load which um, translates to about 40 uh, inches per minute. When we're out on the machine we can always uh, optimize the program and those are fairly conservative numbers. Here's what our stock looks like. Okay, This is 4140 two by two with a quarter inch radius on each side. As we make this part, we're gonna divide the overall thickness of it in two so that we'll take about a quarter of an inch off of each side to leave our part in the middle. Our part, actually it's 5 sixteenths off of each side and uh, because of these rounded shapes, we're gonna have to take about a quarter of an inch off, then flip it over and then do the rest of the work um, to rough in the steps. Okay, uh, yep, that about takes care of that. So, uh, we're using Mastercam tw uh, 2017. It's, uh, it's been a, a, a chore, kind of, but it, um, I really like the, uh, the 2017 uh, ribbon bar setup. I think they did a very good job of uh, rearranging uh, things. And so that the students that are coming into the program now don't know about X8 or 7 or any of that. And, and they, they enjoy it too because we also teach them SolidWorks. All right, so I wanted to show how we set up parts in, in my class. What, what I have them do first is create levels. And the, the levels that I have them create are solids, construction, wireframe, and then surfaces too in case you need them. This is just a, a, a best practices type of thing. So we, uh, and you can choose at any time to make whatever you want visible. We have, on the construction level, 
we've created this, uh, uh, these three uh, pieces of geometry in order to keep our tool in a containment boundary. All right, so I go back to the wireframe, show the solid and the construction geometry. Um, after I have them do four levels, then I have them do named uh, work planes, WCS work construction planes. And here we have uh, a G54 top, which is just a copy of the top. And then we had made a G55 bottom for a copy of the bottom, um, uh, from a copy of the bottom thing. If we had wanted to put these things in any given um, per, uh, area, we've learned how to manipulate that by, um, by using, yeah, this is where the, the genome is on the middle of the bottom and G54 is up here on the top left corner. All right, so um, uh, dynamic milling is only intended really for roughing, all right? So I've left 10 thousandths on all the surfaces, um, on, on all the walls. I like the finish that the dynamic milling leaves, so I have them finish the depths of these um, features but then they can finish the, the side walls um, at their leisure and with a nice slow uh, toolpath leaving a good finish. So those, and, uh, and so we, we just reiterate that um, it's for roughing only. And, um, we're gonna take a half inch end mill and go down an inch and three eighths all the way down to the side of this part and, and cut all the way around of it but only by stepping over 7%. So the depth of cut on a radial depth of cut is only gonna be like 35 thousandths or so. We about double the um, RPMs and, and, uh, and the feed rates, you know, just kind of roughly, but um, that's, that, that's the basic uh, values that we're going to be using. Another thing about dynamic is you must grab the tool very firmly. So, uh, you have to keep it from rotating backwards because it wants to unscrew out of your holder depending on uh, how, uh, how you were holding it. And so if a collet is, is frequently not enough gripping power. Um, a solid holder will work if you have a weld-in flat. But then if you have a weld-in flat, you can't go to the full RPMs because that is not a balanced tool holder. The best thing of all, is to use an end mill with no weld and flat and a hydraulic chuck that squeezes evenly all the way around the shank of the, of the cutting tool. All right, so um, I've showed you the tool, uh, how we set it up, the WCSs, and now I'm going to go to the tool pass. Uh, yeah. All right, so the tool pass, um, start here with a dynamic facing. Uh, um, that this this toolpath is right up here in 2D in this upper left corner, and you hit facing, and we used a defined stock, and then we opened up the, um, these windows. Okay, so um, my tool is I'm going to face this part off with a half inch flat end mill. Uh, I'm going to uh, use a dynamic style. So. If you have a three inch face mill, it's still better to use dynamic because it wants to roll the cutter into the work, which is much easier on the inserts. However, we, we can do dynamic uh, and use that same small step over, in this case 10%. So we're gonna be taking 50 thousandths depth of cut with a, with a, a half inch approach, I mean with a 50% uh, approach distance. And down here we're gonna say, leave 10 thousandths on the floors. So we could follow up later on with a three inch face mill and leave a really nice finish on the bottom of our tool. We don't need depth cuts in dynamic machining because of the fact that you can go very deep and use a whole side of your end mill as opposed to depth cuts where you're only going down 200 at a time. Now we're able to use all that flute length that we paid for on the side of our, uh, on the side of our cutter, on the flutes. So here you can say, see the depth is set for a quarter of an inch. Then we are going to flip the part and do that same dynamic facing uh, uh, tool path again here with the G54 top 
um, WCS. So in between those two, we will stop and flip the part over, and then we will cut all these, rough in all these steps and features. First one that we chose to do was a dynamic, uh, dynamic, the outer contour, the outer box of, of the uh, part. So we chose a dynamic mill. We have our, still our tool right here. And we are careful to always use a comment so that we can see our, in our program out there what it is we're exactly intending to do. And here you see the speeds and feeds. A half inch end mill at 450 goes 3,500 basically. With 3,000 chip load, it goes about 41 inches per minute. We have four tool change sets so that we can see each of our things as we cut them. Down here in cut parameters is where you set the step over. 7% step over, 2.5% uh, tool, minimum tool path radius. We've started using this nice new thing in dynamic of a first pass offset too, so it won't catch on a, on a sharp corner, uh, for instance, like in here or something. Uh, you can step back a little bit and only nick the corners, and it'll reduce the f um, feed also for just for that first pass. We uh, left the gap size at 100%. Then we have a micro lift distance of 10 thousandths. That means whenever it is not engaged in the material, the tool will lift up 10 thousandths and then go 100 inches a minute back to where it's going to pick that cut back up again. Here you can see we're leaving 10 thousandths on the walls once again, and that will come out in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the verify as well. We have 20 thousandths breakthrough so that we will go past the bottom of the part and when we flip it over the one last time to make our final thickness, then uh, we'll be assured that we have gone deep enough. All right, here are the linking parameters. I'm going to take one and three eighths depth of cut, and I always use the clearance move to make sure I set my tool length offset correctly. All right, arc filter I set to eight thousandths because this often will give you less code. This will generate less code for the uh, machine to run and it's only a roughing tool path anyway. So planes are set to G54 top and the coolant is on. So let's just watch this one in a back plot from the top view. All right you can see here is the uh, half inch approach distance and I know I'm not not going to go down an inch and three eighths and plunge in and hurt my part. It's going to come right here. So I will bring this down and show you how it comes down, clear of the part. Then the blue toolpath is showing that 7% step over right there. There's 35 thousandths in between these blue lines. Now it's staying engaged with the stock and is doing that 10 thousandths micro lift. And if I really zoom in, you'll probably see that it is, yeah. It was, it was about 10 thousandths uh, away off the stock. All right. So we do, um, after we do this dynamic uh, um, from the outside, that was, we, we set a geometry, um, yeah, our construction geometry is here. So we use this for the machining area, and then we said to the part, Avoid the part and machine from the outside. So that's why that toolpath runs like that. Next, we are going to do dynamic contours. The best view for this is the isometric one. And we're going to call this line the contour that we want to cut. And then we tell them that there's an inch of stock here and that there's five eighths of an inch of stock here. I drew this line so that I could bridge this gap. Here is one of the contour steps, the first one. All right, I use the same tool, but the tool path type has just got one chain geometry on it. And we don't need any avoidance regions or anything else, but we do need to uh, set up a finishing cut. And I extended the lead in and lead out to make sure that the cutting tool got all the way clear of the part as it travels down that line. All right, so um, you can copy these down and just use the same speeds and feeds as before. And in the linking parameters this time, we're going to be going 5 eighths of an inch deep 
with all the other parameters still the same. Later on on the toolpath, we do the same thing on step two, this blue line here. Then the last thing is I use dynamic to do the slot in the center using that purple geometry you just saw. I could have used area mill, but I just said, um, look, treated it like a pocket. So we'll stay inside this um, region and we'll leave 10 thousandths. And I changed the tool also because I wanted to get good dynamic motion going in that smaller area. I used a 3 16 flat. So just for uh, demonstration purposes, let's look at this 3 16 end mill come down. If, if, if Helix is in, it'll pause at the bottom. And the, although it looks like that's a lot of motion, it also is going by quickly. I've limited the motion in the top view. You can see that <clears throat> it's going to machine completely off of this ledge, off of this edge here. Yeah. Then it finishes the corners. Very little wasted motion. And that works. There are better ways to do it. For instance, that dynamic area. All right. Well, since we've done um, that and we've back plotted enough, let's look at um, the verify on all of these toolpaths. So I'll say select all, and then we'll go to the verify window. I'll go to my isometric view. I've set up the color loop. I only want to see the tool that cuts, not the holders. And we'll have the wireframe. I should, we don't need that for the first view. And you're going to see, the first thing you're going to see is an end mill come in and face off the bottom, then one face off the top. All right, so uh, the speed is set a little bit too quick. Let me back it down a little bit. All right, here we go. So I can rotate around, and you can see how that dynamic toolpath is stepping over 50 thousandths. And it will just keep going because there's no avoidance area to do the entire part. Now it's doing the top cut. That's about three a uh, quarter of an inch, 300 thousandths depth of cut. And it cuts down to 10 thousandths above Z0 to leave a finish pass. Okay. Now we're going to be doing the outer box. We change geometry for a machining area and avoidance area. And uh, we machine from outside. We hit that setting from outside. Now we're doing the machine uh, dynamic contour, where we only had to chain this one line in here. That's step one. There's step two. And now here's that 3 16 end mill doing that slot, 3 16 and going down about 3 8 of an inch. It'll break through this wall and then continue on the outside. Uh, if you think that snaps the tool off, it doesn't. I have done this toolpath before and it works fine. All right, so now we're done and we've roughed in uh, all, of these, all of these features and our, our cycle time is 21 minutes using only two tools. So I'm encouraging more of my students every year to um, go ahead and, and, um, and try these dynamic toolpaths out. I ask them to please let me be present the first time they try them so that we can uh, not snap as many tools off as we do. Well, and that's just what happens. You know, this, we're here to learn. We're not here to have minimal cycle times. But uh, I think these new uh, tool paths and the tool motion that comes from them is, is a great step forward in machining. Thank you.